the first component I wanted to talk about today, which is on the immune system. Um, as you all know, immunity is really important. Our immune systems need to function well. Um, and I want to introduce you uh, to a strange little picture on the left. Um, it's got some red squiggly lines, but it's a representation of something called a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And that name might sound really intimidating, but what you need to know is that this little protein that I've shown you here in this picture um, is one that promotes inflammation in the body. And it gives rise to symptoms that you would probably recognize like fever, um, fatigue, even pain, which you can see I've pictured on the right. Uh, and pro-inflammatory cytokines are actually a natural part of the body's mobilization response to a specific problem. So they're useful for promoting inflammation and our body's immune response to illness or injury or infection. Um, now, the problem arises that when these pro-inflammatory cytokines are elevated over time, which can happen for some people, um, they lead to chronic inflammation and it's not very good for your body. Um, and it starts to have harmful effects. So past work has found that elevated levels, chronically elevated levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines contribute to diabetes, to cardiovascular disease, and to depression. Um, and some of these outcomes are elevated in first responders. And so looking at the pathway to immune functioning may be really important. So what you need to know is that essentially without an illness, an injury, or infection, you really don't want these little proteins floating around your body. Now, we wanted to understand whether awe might be related to immune functioning through these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And specifically, we wondered whether people who are more likely to feel all would have lower levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines in their body. And past work has shown that negative emotions and especially stress are associated with elevated chronic levels of this damaging biomarker. So it isn't too hard to imagine that positive emotions might be associated with lower levels. But until our work, no um, studies had really investigated the link between positive emotions, especially emotions like awe, and levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So that's what we set out to do in one of our studies. Um, we brought in a healthy group of undergraduate students to take part in our study. They filled out a survey um, that asked them about their tendency to experience awe in their daily lives. So you can think about this as how prone people are to experiencing awe. Um, and then we collected a sample of their saliva in the lab and we measured the levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So thanks to some scientific advances, we can now collect this kind of um, important biological information quite easily through saliva. And then we can distill it down in our sample to identify the levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines that an individual has in their body. Now, I should say that these students were not sick. So we can assume that whatever levels we were finding in their body pretty much reflect you know, their chronic levels, their stable levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what we found in this study was that those who feel more awe, who reported feeling more awe, had lower levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines circulating around their body. Um, and again, this is a healthy sample. We would expect that lower levels are better. Obviously, when you're ill, you might see an elevated level, but for these healthy participants, we don't want to see elevated levels. So this is a good sign. Um, and so what we're finding is that the tendency to feel greater awe is associated with better immune functioning. Um, now, these findings are some of the first, so they need to be replicated and they're only correlational. But we are trying now in, in our current work to see if we can manipulate experiences of awe, make people feel this emotion and see if we can actively reduce the presence of this damaging biomarker as a potential intervention. OK, so um, I want to move on to another component of health that I think is really important, um, which is the body. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about the autonomic nervous system, which controls your heart rate, breathing, digestion, so on. And Lonnie um, did a great job introducing um, one component of this autonomic nervous system, um, and that's the sympathetic nervous system or sympathetic branch, which is important uh, for this fight or flight response when you are prepared to face a stressor in your environment. Um, but there's also another system I wanna focus a little bit more on um, in my talk, which is the one I've shown you here on the right, this rest and digest system. Um, and this is called the rest and digest system because it's associated with kind of calm or peaceful or relaxed states in the body. Um, and as I said, this is the part I'm gonna focus on um, today in thinking about Oz's relationship to the body. 
So the main component of the rest and digest system is a nerve called the vagus nerve. And there's a sort of um, interesting looking picture to the right of this. Um, I wanted to show you that it comes down from the brain and really travels throughout your body. Um, it touches your, innervates your stomach, your larynx, but importantly, your heart, and it slows your heart down. Now, um, past work has suggested that having a chronic higher vagal activation or activation of this vagus nerve is an important marker for uh, good health outcomes like lower risk of hypertension or coronary cardiac issues, and even potentially faster recovery from surgery. So this is something um, that, you know, if we can cultivate this uh, elevated activity in this vagus nerve is something that we would want to do. And so in one study, we wanted to look at Oz's relationship to this specific element of the parasympathetic nervous system. And so um, we had our undergraduates like Lonnie's come in and they were connected to physiological measures, which you can see picture here. Um, and then we had them watch an awe inspiring video. We chose to focus on one where um, people saw the earth and then zoomed out into space. Um, and throughout this whole uh, time, we measured uh, a non-invasive index of their vagal nerve activation. And in our study, what we found was that inducing awe was associated with increased vagal activation. And I do want to mention that um, these findings are, um, you know, one of many uh, people have looked at, uh, you know, virtual reality environments, which are really interesting and find these effects, but they don't always find them. So it's something we need to study more um, to find out overall where the boundaries of this effect are. For us, we find that it does relate to how positive people's awe experiences are. So I told you we had a video of awe, uh, or a video of space rather, and zooming out. Some people found this awe-inspiring and really exciting, and they felt um, you know, how amazing um, this is to be part of this large, vast space. Other people felt awe, but they also felt a little bit um, fearful and maybe insignificant um, as this little pale blue dot in vast space. And what we found is that the more people had these sort of positive experiences with awe, the better it was for their uh, vagal functioning. So that may be a really important element is really leaning into those positive awe experiences um, for your health. And so uh, there's you know, a lot of really interesting work in this area. And I think we should pursue the question of whether awe can promote better cardiac health um, and thereby uh, influence how your body is functioning. Now, I wanted to finish up with one final component um, and talk a little bit about the neuroscience of awe and make the case that awe is associated with uh, activation of the brain in a way that promotes a greater outward focus and less internal focus on the self, which may offer benefits for physical and certainly mental health. I do want to state up front that I'm not a neuroscientist, so I will be highlighting a study from another laboratory that's demonstrated the effects of awe on the brain, but I think this work is really important for us to think about when we're considering the biological implications of feeling awe. So um, recently, researchers have become interested in a neural network called the default mode network. I've pictured it here on the left for those of you who want to nerd out on brain photos. Um, but this network is active when people seem to be evaluating their progress towards certain personal goals, or even when they're just thinking about memories from the past or thinking about what they might want to do in the future. So you can think about this network as active when we're just sitting around and think, letting our minds wander. Um, many of us end up considering past and future events. Um, and so interestingly, um, there's some more past work that's identified this area shows reduced activation or less activation when we're really deeply engaged in an activity um, that focuses us, as, focuses us outward. So you might have heard of these as flow states, but when we're really like in our zone, maybe you're playing a sport or playing an instrument, um, it happens often when people are meditating, for example. Um, and the idea is that when we're absorbed in something else besides the ego or the self, um, we become obviously less involved in our internal world um, and it shifts our attention outwards. And so, um, you know, critically, it's thought to be less active when we're focused outward. So the default mode network processes information from this sort of more egocentric point of view. And our, our, the researcher's question was whether all might reduce this egocentric point of view and reduce activation in the default mode network. Um, so in a study my colleagues ran, participants watched um, videos of nature scenes, especially beautiful nature scenes. Um, and this was done while they were in the fMRI and their brain activity was being recorded. 
And what the researchers found was that, in fact, inducing awe, making participants have this experience in the lab, reduced activation in the default mode network. Now, I don't want to insinuate that activation in the default network is bad, but it does seem that there are moments when it's useful to really be focused outward, externally, away from the self, and that those moments um, can help promote greater connection with other people um, and perhaps a more healthy outlook on the world. So um, this work shows that feeling awe does seem to change neural patterns, focusing the mind outward. Some data-driven suggestions. First of all, I really hope through this symposium, you can um, be convinced that awe is not a luxury. I hope I can show you that it's important for your physical health, but certainly it's also important for your mental health. You know, going out in nature, going on trips, going to concerts, they may feel like luxuries that we can't afford when we're really busy, but I would say that you should build those experiences into your um, daily lives or your lives in general in order to promote awe. Also, actively seek out awe. You know, sometimes we're lucky and awe experiences happen to us, but most of us feel awe from experiences we go out and have. So if you know you feel awe from music, go to a concert. Um, if you know you feel awe in nature, go for a walk. And lastly, find awe in the everyday. So this is a picture I took uh, of the park near my house in Toronto um, during the fall foliage change. And you can see here, um, you know, it's incredibly beautiful and it's not a hard thing for me to do in my daily life to take 10 minutes out of my work schedule and go for a little walk. So the extent that you can find awe in these everyday experiences, nature around your house, for example, or beautiful sunsets, um, do try to do that because it is a way to maintain and potentially cultivate your physical health.